From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. One of the biggest winners in election 2017, Valley Schools. After a long year of funding cuts, 27 Maricopa County districts get a funding boost from voters. Plus, are voting rights under attack? What local politicians and activists are doing to put more power in the hands of minorities? And one binational trade conference has Arizona leaders discussing ways to strengthen U.S. ties with Mexico. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Tyler Finger. And I'm Madison Connor. Thanks for joining us. Preliminary election results are in for Maricopa County, and there is good news for school districts. For the first time in recent memory, voters approved all of the district bonds and budget overrides. Cronkite News reporter Erica Arrington joins us live with a reaction. I spoke to Mayor Greg Stanton, who said he expects to see bigger and greater things coming to our education system in the near future. Right now, though, districts are talking about how they will spend these new funds. With the results of all 27 schools, budget bonds, and overrides approved, victories are being celebrated. Well, it's really exciting that, you know, for the first time ever, you know, if the votes continue the way that they are looking to continue, that we'll have all of them passing in Maricopa County. Erin Hart, CEO of Expect More Arizona, and her team work to make changes that will benefit education. School districts have plans for the funds. Those include teacher pay increases, adding art in kindergarten classes, and supplies such as textbooks and new computer labs. In the Phoenix Union High School District, communication director Craig Platenik says it's rewarding to see the increased investment in education. It really shows that, um, that our voters care about education. It's probably the number one uh, issue for them. Platenik is happy that alongside wealthier communities, urban central schools also got attention in this election. A lot of gratitude to uh, the constituents to know that they value education, particularly in the central city. Mayor Greg Stanton says Arizona love their teachers, students, and staff and are willing to vote for those schools no matter what it takes. The voters seem to be putting more of an emphasis on education. Only about half the override proposals passed before 2015. In the Broadcast Center, Erica Arrington, Cronkite News. Meanwhile, five Arizona schools are among 342 getting recognition as some of the best in the country. Washington Bureau reporter Fraser Allen Best attended the National Blue Ribbon Ceremony put on by the U.S. Department of Education. Seats were filled with mostly principals, administrators, and teachers. But Jason Phillips, principal of Arizona College Prep, says the thanks at his Chandler School goes to an even wider group. Um, we have parents that greatly support our program and teachers who are extremely dedicated to what they do every day. And we have students who really want to uh, advance and uh, get the best out of their education. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos started the program with praise for the winners before the school's representatives filed across the stage. Arizona had five winning schools at the elementary, middle, and high school level. Jennifer Benjamin, the principal of Palm Valley Elementary School in Goodyear, says she gained a lot just being among other top educators. Just get ideas and experiences from other places around the nation. Phillips had a similar experience and said the lessons learned here will help in a state where schools can face funding challenges. You know, with the state finances, we have to do more um, with, I don't know how else to say it, sometimes less. Um, but I think with the quality teachers we have and the parents and the students, we always rise above. In Washington, Fraser Allen Best, Cronkite News. In addition to Palm Valley and Arizona College Prep, other state Blue Ribbon schools were Acacia Elementary in Vail, Franklin at Brim Hall Elementary in Mesa, and Seton Catholic Preparatory in Chandler. While education was at the forefront of elections here in the Valley, major governor and legislative races in New Jersey and Virginia are making headlines nationwide. East Coast Democrats have made a major rebound since President Trump's election. Phil Murphy won the governor's race in New Jersey. Ralph Northam won his governor's seat in Virginia. And Mayor Bill de Blasio cruised over into his second term as mayor of New York City. Democrats in Virginia are also sweeping through, changing red to blue in their state assembly. 
Although the next presidential election is three years away, groups are already working to get more people registered to vote. Cronkite News reporter Holly Bernstein shows us how the ACLU and other groups are taking on this issue now. Why voting rights are always under attack. It's a simple situation that our participation in the government it views inherently dangerous because it shifts the power from pure white supremacy to just white supremacy light. Michael Ingram of Black Lives Matter was among local politicians and activists speaking at a panel discussing defending the right to vote Saturday, especially for those who are in the minority. The panel addressed the history and potential solutions of the goals of voting rights work, including increasing voter registration turnout and reducing racial and class disparities in voting. Every four years, I get 200 complaints about people not being able to vote. And I, I always say, the time to worry about your voting rights isn't right before the election. It's two years before the election even starts. The panel says the Supreme Court has weakened voting rights, like in Shelby County versus Holder. In 2013, the court ruled Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is unconstitutional. As a result, states have been able to change voting laws without federal oversight. According to ACLU, in 2016, 14 states had new voting restrictions in place. Arizona was one of those, with limitations on mail-in ballot collection. Maricopa County recorder Adrian Fontes says one way to reduce racial and class disparities in voting is through education. Reaching out uh, to a lot of folks that uh, did not necessarily have folks coming out and talking to them. So we've had different focus groups in our office uh, talking about the issues that are in, of interest uh, to a bunch of different types of communities. Fontes also says Maricopa County is working with other counties in Arizona to share resources. Ingram said at the panel, the best way to get people to vote is to work year round. A little bit of training, a little bit of investment, and then I can be a better advocate for my community than you ever can be. It's about an investment, and I'm going to be there year round talking to my folks all the time. In downtown Phoenix, Holly Bernstein, Cronkite News. The idea of voting centers and jails for people who have not been convicted was also discussed. Fontes says he'll have to coordinate with Sheriff Penzone, and while he decided to hold off on the idea for now by working on other implementations, he says the idea will be explored for future elections. President Trump's nominee to lead the Department of Homeland Security appears to disagree with Trump on one of his key pet projects, the U.S.-Mexico border wall. Kirsten, Kirsten, Kirsten Nelson was questioned by the Senate Homeland Security Committee today, and she said she would likely follow the agenda of her predecessor, John Kelly, which includes limiting Trump's proposed border wall. Uh, there is no need for a wall from sea to shining sea. What we need to do is work with the operators. Uh, should I be confirmed, I would look forward to speaking with state and local officials, those on the ground, both law enforcement and federal law enforcement, to include CBP, to understand where we need some sort of physical barrier. Okay. Technology, as you know, plays a key part, and we can't forget it. Building a better economic relationship with Mexico. That was the subject of a national trade discussion earlier today. Arizona's Governor Doug Ducey discussed where Arizona stands in regards to the North American Free Trade Agreement, also known as NAFTA. Arizona doesn't want to just sit on the sidelines and see what happens. We are advocating for what we want to see is a free and fair trade relationship with emphasis about how important this relationship and free trade is to the state of Arizona. Mexico ambassador to the U.S. Geronimo Gutierrez added that it was a good time to be vocal and educate others about the benefits of the relationship between our two countries. Census data shows that Mexico is Arizona's top foreign trade partner, accounting for about 30 percent of all of the state's international exports. Strokes aren't typically thought of as a young person's affliction. However, the Centers for Disease Control are saying something different. Coming up on Cronkite News, how avoiding these risk factors can prevent you from having a stroke at an earlier age. And how driverless vehicles will be taking over the streets in no time. What we learn what, we learn what this self-driving service is doing to compete against other ride-sharing services. Officially from 36. And he hooks it in! Arizona State wins! Heaving one deep, and it is caught! Dylan Strong! Do you believe it?
children of planet Earth. Human beings are a curious bunch. What are we going to see when we get really close? Wow. Oh my God, absolutely spectacular. We are at a remarkable moment. Yes. We're going farther than any exploration ever has. Arizona House Speaker J.D. Mesnard announced today that the House of Representatives has launched multiple investigations into reports of sexual harassment at the legislature. Two female representatives have given interviews and made public comments about sexual advances they have experienced. In a statement, Mesnard wrote, those of us in government should be held to the highest standard and any form of harassment will not be tolerated. I encourage anyone, whether it be legislators, staff, lobbyists, or others with allegations of sexual harassment at the legislature, to work with investigators. And this afternoon, Governor Doug Ducey tweeted his support for the investigation. He said the probe should be bipartisan and expanded if necessary. He wrote that there can be absolutely no tolerance for sexual harassment in the halls of our state capitol or any organization, private or public. Construction of sound barriers is now underway along the Loop 202 South Mountain Freeway. Crews will build walls along 11 miles that, that the freeway runs along neighborhoods in West Phoenix and Ahwatukee. Most walls will range between 16 and 20 feet in height and will have a horizontal line pattern designed in collaboration with the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. In all, the freeway's sound walls will include more than 1 million masonry blocks. The South Mountain Freeway is set to open in 2019. Waymo will allow the public to start riding in the fully self-driving vehicles in the next few months. Participants in Waymo's early rider program will be first to ride alone in the cars. For now, there will be no charge for these rides. The news is a step toward Waymo offering a paid service that competes with ride-sharing companies like Uber and Lyft. It's an alarming trend in strokes. Since 2013, the age of those having strokes is falling. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control. Cronkite News reporter Sierra Delgado talks to Arizona's experts about how to reverse this trend. Mike Murtha was 48 years old when he had a stroke that left him with a paralyzed right side and other problems. I had a trach or tracheotomy and a feeding tube, so I was fed through a, basically a bag through a tube into my body. I couldn't speak at that point, couldn't move the arm or the leg. Another Valley resident woke up in the middle of the night at age 50. Something was wrong. My blood pressure went up to 25 over 193 that night. I was big the doctor and if you have high blood pressure, make sure you take your pills because I didn't know I had high blood pressure. Risk factors like high blood pressure, smoking, and hypertension are what is now helping increase strokes in people who are younger than the usual stroke patient. In the last decade or more, one trend that's starting to emerge is that in people under the age of 65, their risk factors are going up, not down. So we're seeing more hypertension, more diabetes, more obesity, and more people with multiple combinations of those risk factors. The Centers for Disease Control says Arizona is one of 21 states and the District of Columbia where stroke deaths have increased since 2013. According to Dr. Jeremy Payne, it is hard to get younger people to start addressing the potential risk factors. You have a conversation with a young person, say, about smoking. Realistically, that conversation may not pay off for 20 or 30 years. It's really difficult to get people's heads around the idea that behaviors now may not pay off until you're much older, but when they do pay off, they pay off in ways that we can directly measure. I still can't live on my own. I can't take care of myself. Can't put shoes and socks on. So it's very frustrating. I can't work on a job at this point. I'm hopeful that I will be able to eventually, but as I said, recovery is a very, very slow, even if it's steady, it's still a very slow process. Dr. Payne advises to get your blood pressure checked regularly, exercise, and eat nutritiously to help lower your risk factors. In Phoenix, Sierra Delgado, Cronkite News. Think F-A-S-T to help detect a stroke. Look for face drooping, arm weakness, and speech difficulty. If you notice these signs, it's time to call 911 immediately. 
Tonto National Forest is about to see some changes. Park employees and activists alike have discussed recreational and environmental issues motivating the new changes. But are everyone's concerns being heard? How the Tonto Forest Service is trying to balance recreation and preservation. Temperatures are slowly dropping and it might be time to bundle up. What temperatures to expect coming up? Fridays, it's at Cronkite News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Then join us for at Cronkite News, our weekly refresh, each Friday at 5 on Arizona PBS. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. Join us each weekday at 5, 30, and 10 as we bring you the top newsmakers who impact the state. We cover the stories in depth that shape and affect our local communities, and we take the time to ensure that all voices are equally heard. For more than 30 years, Arizona Horizon has been your voice and your source for what matters most, right here on Arizona PBS. Changes could be coming to the Tonto National Forest, and new proposal recreational shooting areas could be restricted, but hunting and fishing areas could be expanded. Reporter Mia Atkins is live in downtown Phoenix to tell us how the Forest Service is trying to balance recreation with preservation. Tonto National Forest officials held the first of eight public meetings, all to give the public a chance to voice their opinion on what they want to see. Dozens of people showed up at the first open house in Mesa. Simone Netherlands is the president of the Salt River Wild Horse Management Group, one of the larger groups there. She believes the plan should protect the wild horses. It's important that that's recognized and that they're not discriminated or anything affects them adversely, like perhaps pesticide use could affect them adversely. The proposal covers topics from recreational shooting to hiking and fishing, but there are hundreds of topics within the nearly three million acres. Kelly Richards, a Tonto National Forest employee, says that's why the Forest Service is reaching out to the public to help them prioritize. Being Forest Service employees, we've got our ideas, but we tend to not think outside the box on certain things. So it's great to get that input from the public too when they see certain things that maybe we didn't notice. Mesa District Ranger Gary Hanna says many recreational shooters are concerned about the changes being suggested. May need uh, clarification on issues that affect them that we may have uh, missed. Again, it's, it's uh, not our plan, it's our public's plan on how we want to man manage their forest. Netherlands and her horse activist group were excited about the opportunity to give their input and hope to make a difference for wildlife. So we're all interested in this subject. We're, we're all interested in, have, we all have the best interest of the wild horses in mind as well as the public does. So basically, you know, we're here to defend them and make sure anything in this proposal is, uh, is good for them as well. The meetings are held at various locations across the state. If you'd like to attend one of these meetings, just head to our website, cronkitenews.azpbs.org, to find more information. Live in downtown Phoenix, I'm Mia Atkins, Cronkite News. This 80-degree weather sure has been a treat, but will these cooler temperatures be sticking around for the rest of the week, Madison? Well, Tyler, it does seem like the fall weather is finally here to stay. Our high today is 82 degrees, but we are currently sitting at 81. There are some clouds in the sky and that humidity level is high, but as you can see, we are still well above that average temperature of 79. Now, looking at temperatures across the state, you see at 58 in the Grand Canyon and in Flagstaff, 57 in Sholo and 80 down in Yuma. Here in the Valley, however, we have 81 in Buckeye, 83 in Goodyear, and then the hottest area is the Gila Bend at 88. Now looking at our seven day forecast on Thursday, we have a high of 86. Saturday, which is Veterans Day, we have a high of 84. And then the rest of the week, we jump up on Monday to 87. On Wednesday, we do drop back down to 82. For Cronkite Weather, I'm Madison Connor. Still ahead on Cronkite News, a heart of service. This former Navy SEAL served his country, and now he's serving customers. How his time in the military led him to a new business.
this fall. I'm so excited. What? <laughs> from the inspiring to the amazing. You're in the presence of history. The compelling. He said, welcome home. It was just a powerful moment. To the astounding. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> and from the breathtaking. This is real. A journey to Mars. To the electrifying. We're going to change the world. All this and more. All this fall. The new weekly show where we tackle the taboo and debate the tough questions with some of the most interesting minds in the game. I'm Carlos Watson, Electrifying Conversation, Friday, only on PBS. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. In honor of Veterans Day this Friday, a troop member turned businessman is giving back. Victory Coffee was found by former U.S. Navy SEAL Cade Courtley, and every six weeks he donates a couple hundred pounds of his coffee to VA offices around the United States. Today, he is here in Phoenix. Courtley was a U.S. Navy SEAL platoon commander and sniper for nine years. When he was deployed, his 10-minute coffee breaks got him through the tough times. That's why he started this coffee company based in Denver. But he travels every six weeks to different parts of the country to share his passion with fellow veterans. Some who are waiting hours to see doctors. He says that giving back also allows him to get the feeling of camaraderie that he misses from active duty. Every time I do one of these things, I try and walk through and try and say hello to as many people as I can. Uh, I try and take that cup of coffee out of their hand that they're drinking and give them a piece of this stuff. <laughs> and uh, look, it's, it's, again, it's just an opportunity for me to re-engage with a group of, of folks I used to go to battle with. Courtley didn't specify where he will be heading next, but will most likely continue moving west. Visitors have been leaving mementos at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington almost since the day it was de dedicated in 1982. Those items now number more than 250,000. But unlike any other memorial in Washington, these items are carefully preserved. Washington reporter Bailey Vogt explains. On a cold November morning at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, Howie Howe comes to see his two foster brothers' names on the memorial wall and to leave photos in memory of one. One of him and one of us at the last reunion when there were four of us still above the ground. Now we're down to three. Visitors like Howe leave items at the wall every day to honor a loved one whose name is here among the fallen from that war. I think a, a lot of people are, you know, really come here and they, they leave what's heartfelt and I, I think that would be a comfort to them to know that it wasn't just dumped in a dumpster someplace. Well, those items might not stay there forever. They're not going to be destroyed either. Instead, they're going to be taken to a facility in Maryland where they'll be cataloged for historical purposes. The items are brought to this National Park Service warehouse in Landover, Maryland. Museum curator Jan Fulkertz oversees the cataloging and preservation of the estimated 200 to 250,000 items. This is a secure and environmentally controlled facility um, and we uh, keep the items that are left at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in storage here. Those items come from all over the map in more ways than one. From Arizona alone, Fulkert shows items ranging from an APH-5 flight helmet to postcards, from hats to stuffed animals. Fulkert says that the main focus of the collection is to keep a record of the stories that the Vietnam War created, no matter how incomplete they are. What we get is what we get, um, but we get so many different stories and so many different things um, that it really tells um, so much of what um, happened in Vietnam and what's happening since and why the memorial is important to different people. 
Howe agrees, saying that he appreciates what leaving an item at the wall allows for those who lost loved ones during the war. People leave things that they don't, they don't necessarily uh, be understood by others, but they're significant to them for, for, for whatever reason. On the National Mall, Bailey Vote, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's ahead on PBS NewsHour. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Join Miles O'Brien as he explores how Cuba seeks to cash in on its diverse wildlife through ecotourism. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.